Hello everyone and welcome to the FameLab Basel semi-final of 2022. My name is Selam Maniolo and I'm a PhD student at DBSSE of ETH Zurich. My research focuses on studying the effect of antibiotics on the membrane of bacteria to learn more about their action mechanism. And it is my pleasure to host this year's Basel Heat, two years after I participated in the FameLab. It was a great experience that initiated my interest in science communication and also allowed me to take part in the national final of Switzerland of FameLab. And today I'm very excited to meet with the participants of this year's Basel FameLab edition and listen to their talks with all of you. Before we start, I would like to introduce the FameLab a bit to you. FameLab is one of the biggest science competitions in the world and it was founded by the British Council in 2005. It is truly an international phenomenon and we have over 35 countries participating thus far and 9,000 scientists presenting in that time. FameLab welcomes people from different science fields and all of them have one overarching goal, which is to make science accessible to the public and share our work with a larger audience. But there is also one golden rule and that is the three minute rule. The participants have to convince our jury in a three minute science slam and in their talks they have to deliver three C's, which are content, clarity and charisma. The big three C's are important for the FameLab competition and our jury will evaluate the performances based on these criteria. The participants are not allowed to use any visual or audio aids like slides, but they can use props that they can carry on the stage. And before we start with the talks, I would like to thank Life Science Zurich as the main organizer of FameLab in Switzerland, British Embassy for their crucial support, and finally, Graduate Center of the University of Basel for organizing the FameLab Basel Heat. And now we all know how FameLab functions, we can start with the talks without a further ado. Hey, my name is Lydia and I'm a PhD student at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute in Basel and I'm doing my PhD in epidemiology. And today I have a question for you. Who of you has ever heard about the disease schistosomiasis? I bet half of you never have. And that's why schistosomiasis is among the 20 most neglected tropical diseases worldwide. And schistosomiasis is a warm disease. And it's so neglected that even on the internet, I couldn't find a t-shirt with the correct worm. So this little guy has to serve as a substitute today. But I'm going to tell you one thing that should never be neglected about schistosomiasis. And that is that it's endemic in 78 countries, so in every third country in the world. And it's a health threat. It can cause infertility in women, stunted growth in children, anemia, and ulcers and tumors such as bladder cancer. And why am I going to tell you this? Because I'm passionate about fighting against schistosomiasis. And my project is taking place on Pemba Island in Tanzania. And Pemba has a very long history of interventions against schistosomiasis. 30 years ago, a lot of people of the population had urine that looked like this, very bloody, very red. And blood in the urine is the leading symptom for schistosomiasis. Then intervention started where everybody of the population was treated and this was going very well. So nowadays we have a much better situation in Pemba and most of the people have urine like this now, very yellow and very healthy. And um, I'm asking you like if nowadays the majority of your population has urine like this, is it still the correct intervention to treat everybody? With our project, we are moving away from one intervention fits all to every intervention fitted to every region, to every community, to every school. But the goal has, it has stayed the same. We want a future with eliminated schistosomiasis. And I'm positive for PEMBA and the world that together we can reach this goal. So that in the future, everyone has urine like this and no one has urine like this anymore. Thank you very much. So you've probably heard that everything around us, you, me, this chair, is made of atoms. But have you ever seen an atom? 
Just picture for yourself for a moment what it looks like. Maybe something like this. A nice little proton-neutron core with electrons flying around in neat orbits. It turns out atoms don't actually look like this. And I'm not going to talk about quantum mechanics and wave functions and everything. I'm going to talk about what an atom actually looks like when you look at it by eye. And you might be thinking, come on, it's impossible. You can't actually see an atom. Turns out, you can. And the first step to seeing an atom is actually surprisingly simple. I'm going to demonstrate it with this balloon. So by rubbing this balloon on my head, I can separate negative charges onto the balloon and positive charges onto my hair to get my hair to stand on end, be attracted to the balloon. Essentially, we're using electric fields. And we use exactly the same thing to catch single charged atoms. So physicists back in the 60s already developed devices known as ion traps to trap single charged atoms or ions. So the idea behind it is that you take a series of metal plates, you apply voltages to them, so charges, which then either attract or repel this charged atom. By cleverly choosing your metal plates and your voltages, you can create a point in the center of the trap where the atom is securely held in place. But just holding an atom in place doesn't mean you can see it. To see an atom, it needs to give off light because this is how we see everything. It either gives off light or reflects light. So how do you get an atom to give off light? Well, you need to excite it. You need to get it to a high energy state. And when it drops down to a low energy state, it gives off this energy, typically as light. And we do this with lasers, but not just any laser. It has to match the atom you're trying to trap. So for example, for barium, this laser looks sort of bluish green. And so if you shine this blue green laser on your barium atom, which is held in place in your ion trap, the atom will get excited. And after a short period of time, usually a few nanoseconds, give off this light again, or this energy again as light. And this light we can see by eye. And so like magic, you've made the invisible visible. So what does an atom look like? Well, something like this. Have you ever imagined that the woman's bleeding during her period is one of the main pillars for the creation of life? But do we really know why there is bleeding? And what happens in the meantime when there is no bleeding? Well, let's take it from the beginning. It all happens in the uterus, this inverted pear-shaped female reproductive organ. The role of the uterus is to provide the baby's first home until it's ready to come to the world. Now the lining of the uterus, which is known as the endometrium, will nourish and support the development of the baby. If there is no baby, this lining will break down during a woman's period, and this process is known as menstruation. During menstruation, blood and other parts of the tissue will be secreted through the vagina out of the body. This is an absolutely normal process, and quite remarkable too if we think that every month this lining will break down and repair itself without any scarring. And guess what? This happens more than 400 times in a woman's reproductive life. But let's take a closer look. It all comes down to hormones, which take rides up and down like a crazy roller coaster in a farm park. After menstruation, estrogen will help the endometrium, so the lining, to re-thicken in order to be able to receive the baby. Later on, progesterone will kick off and cause changes to the endometrium so that it prepares itself for pregnancy. Thank God you're not pregnant every month, in which case the hormonal levels will go down and menstruation will start again. All that is good, but have you ever wondered how the endometrium can repair itself so efficiently? And most importantly, what goes wrong? What happens when this process goes wrong? It's true, and women don't talk about it too much, that one quarter of women in reproductive age will suffer from menstruation-related problems, such as pain and excessive bleeding, and we still know so little about it. But please don't lose hope, because in 2017, a discovery was made that allowed us to study this remarkably plastic tissue. 
This has been possible with the use of organoids, mini tiny organs, that uh, behave the same way that the real uterus does. We in the lab use these organoids to understand how we menstruate and how the endometrium repairs itself. And hopefully one way, understand these problems and try to, try to treat them. The uterus is an incredible tissue, the correct function of which ensures the continuation of our species. It's high time we explored it more. Thank you. Welcome everyone, my name is Christian and I'm a trash man. Without me and my garbage truck, the whole city probably will be piled up with trash in a few weeks or months. And the same thing happens with the cell if my molecular co-workers doesn't work properly, resulting in diseases like Alzheimer's, ALS, Parkinson's or even cancer. But what is known about these molecular trash mans? So the garbage truck in the cell is known as proteasome. And it's just like a huge complex and every protein that comes close to him gets degraded. Next to the garbage truck, there's also a protein called ubiquitin E3 ligase. It just functions as a stamp and it stamps every protein with the say like Oh, it's not necessary anymore and it can be degraded by the proteasome. But what about the trash man who actually bring the protein that needs to be degraded close to this ligase? There not so much is known. It's just that every protein seems to have a certain specific ligase that will degrade it. And there might be over 10,000 different proteins. But like the Overall concept is super simple, just bring a protein close to the ligase, the stamp and the proteasome will do the rest. And this is exactly what Sagamoto invented in 2001 with the beautiful name Brotec. Brotec is short for protein targeted chimera. Chimera is this creature with one lion head and another dragon head. And this is how it works. So we have the lion head and it just bites to a certain protein. The lion head can be a peptide sequence or any antibody fragment just that recognizes a certain protein. And now comes the dragon into play. The dragon binds to this ubiquitin ligase stamp. And with the protec, the protein that needs to be degraded comes in close proximity, guts the stamp and then get degraded by the proteasome. This is highly new and so far the clinical research is outstanding, resulting in therapies against cancer, ALS and Parkinson. So guys, you see, without us trash men, nothing would really work. And if you see next time a trash man, please treat us accordingly. Thank you for your attention. When you think about forensic medicine, you probably think about autopsies. An autopsy is a very traditional technique which is used for a long time. So I think the time is overdue to bring forensic medicine into the future by using modern examination methods like magnetic re resonance imaging, in short, MRI. One question in forensic medicine is if the disease died of brain edema. A brain edema is a fluid accumulation within the brain tissue this causes the brain tissue to expand and then it's pressed against the rigid skull. This causes an increased um, intracranial pressure. During autopsies, the forensic pathologists open the skull and extract the brain. And then they, they examine if this is a brain edema or not. Of course, this manipulation <coughs> causes alterations of the brain edema. And then it's difficult to differentiate these manipulations to a brain edema. A better solution to detect brain edema would be to use MRIs, MRI scans. Um, using MRI scanners, we can keep the, the body intact and the brain remains in the skull. Um, we were able to show in a study that the MRI parameters correlate with the water content. So we can use MRI scans to detect brain edema. But not only brain edema can be detected using MRI, but also other causes of death, like bleedings or gas accumulations. 
Although MRI scanners are expensive and not really widespread in forensic institutes yet, yet I think um, this will change in the future. So if you think about um, forensic medicine um, now, we hopefully don't only think about autopsies, but also about magnetic resonance imaging. When you would ask my roommates what my job is, they would tell you that I'm doing research in the field of medicine for dead people. Well, they're not completely wrong, but let me explain you my research in more detail. And for that, we have to start at a crime scene. So we are now in the living room of the deceased here. Deceased is here represented by a skull only. The deceased body has been found in exactly this position one hour ago by the police. The death has then been graded as an unclear death due to the unknown circumstances, which is where forensic comes in. The goal in forensic is to find out what the cause of death is. And for that, the body is examined. There are now two ways to examine this body or hear the brain. One way is to open the skull, take out the brain and examine the brain, which is done in autopsy. This is, however, invasive, requires a lot of resources, and by taking out the tissue, the tissue is automatically modified. The second way would be to image the brain using magnetic resonance imaging, short MRI. This is non-invasive and allows to examine the whole body without taking tissue out of the body. The findings of the MRI can then either support a later autopsy by providing additional information, or it can directly lead to the cause of death. There is, however, also an issue with MRI when imaging disease, and I want to show you this obstacle by an example. So if we image my brain, we receive this image here. If we image the brain of the disease here, we receive this image. There's obviously a huge difference in contrast between both images. And the difference between me and the deceased is that the body temperature of the deceased is much cooler than my body temperature. So the MRI is temperature sensitive. And in our research, we aim to correct for this image difference here by adjusting the MRI acquisition settings according to the temperature of the deceased. With that, we receive then images which are comparable to the images of living persons, and therefore they can be diagnosed equally. Back to our skull, we then adapt the image acquisition settings for the temperature of the deceased, and we receive this image here. I'm sorry. This image is now comparable to the image of my brain regarding the contrast, and we are now able to see that he died due to this intracerebral bleeding, which you could not clearly diagnose in the first image. So temperature correction in post-mortem MRI is crucial for forensic findings. So MRI has a huge potential for supporting the detection of the cause of death and providing additional key information to legal authorities or as my roommates would say, it has a huge potential for the medicine for dead people. Thank you. When I was a teenager, there was a time where many of my friends were sick with mononucleosis, a flu-like fever. It's also called the kissing disease because uh, it's transmissible via your saliva. And while many friends were quite sick for a week or two, we never felt too bad for them because after all, they were around kissing people and that was desirable and even worth the risk of a mild fever. What we didn't know back then is that the Epstein-Barr virus, which can cause mononucleosis, is associated with uh, multiple sclerosis, a much more serious disease in which your own body attacks the protein layers around your nerves. It's hard to check for any association between the Epstein-Barr virus and other diseases because it's really abundant, it's everywhere. Almost all adults will have had contact with it at some point during their lives. So if you want to check for any association, you want to look in firstly many people and secondly young adults, which haven't had contact yet. One way to do that is to look in the US military, apparently. When researchers, uh, well, one thing that helps is that they have to give uh, biannual blood samples in which you can check for uh, past infection with the Epstein-Barr virus. When researchers did that for the around uh, 1,000 people who developed MS during their active service in the last two decades, they found that all but one had an EBV infection, an Epstein-Barr virus infection, around seven years prior to the first onset of MS. In a control group within the military, in the same time frame, only a little more than half had an EBV infection. Statistically, this makes it 32 times more likely to develop MS if you had an EBV infection. It's hard to tell how a viral infection could cause such a devastating disease many, year late, many years later. 
and, uh, but there is some speculation. The Epstein-Barr virus belongs to the herpes family of viruses, and just like the one that causes a cold sore. And for the cold sore, it's, it's, it famously never leaves your body, and it comes back, it breaks out when you're sick, when you're stressed, something like that. The Epstein-Barr virus could play the same game and hide in an even more cynical place, within your immune system even, infiltrate certain cells of your immune system. And by that, it would wreak havoc there and uh, destabilize, destabilize it so much that the body would start, or the immune system would freak out and start attacking its own tissue, as it does in MS. But even without knowing the exact mechanism, one thing we can do right now, and it should have highest priority, is to develop a vaccine against it. We don't know the cause of long COVID, but we don't know that the vaccination decreased the risk of it developing it. So a vaccine against EBV could do the same for MS, and it would make a lot more first kisses less risky. Hello, my name is Tim Keller. I'm a computer science student here at the University of Basel. And um, I want to talk about expect goals today. And for my background, I, I grew up in a football family. So every Saturday and Sunday, we went to the local football field or to the stadium here in Basel. And um, what I catched on really early is that everyone at a football game that's watching, they always have their own opinion and they really like to express their opinion. Like a lot of sentences you would hear at a football game would be like, oh, that chance is really missed. They, uh, that was a really good chance and they missed it. That was a 100% chance that they would have to score on that or they waste a lot of chances and that shot was really hard to make. And expected goals is exactly these uh, expressions but with a mathematical number behind it. The, the, the name is a little bit misleading, like expected goals, who is expecting a goal? But uh, in the end, it's just a probability of a shot that uh, it goes in and is a goal. Um, the probability is uh, modeled by a mathematical model through different factors. Uh, first of all, it's uh, with uh, multiple thousands of shots and it factors a lot of important things uh, into it. The most important thing is the distance from the goal. Like if you are really near to the goal, then uh, the, the probability of scoring is way higher because it's harder to miss the goal. And if you're farther away, it's uh, way more difficult to score a goal. Like it's, it lines up with the expectation from watching, but uh, it's not like having a, it's not uh, as well vulnerable to biases um, as like the opinion, like you, if you have seen the same shot three times after, non, uh, after another, you're already vulnerable to recency bias that that shot is not that hard to make, but it could be that it's way harder to make in reality. Other factors are like the angle to the goal, the position of the goalkeeper, or if a defender is in the way of a shot. Um, that's just some of the factors, but there are multiple more factors, but these are the most important ones. And they line up with uh, what is expressed on a football field on a Sunday or on a Saturday. And, and they, if you sum up all the expected goals for, uh, sh for shots in a game, you can see like which team was better in creating chances. And also for like singular shots, if you have the probability value, you can like use it to uh, educate your opinion on shots and express it and use it to express it on a Sunday. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please strap on your seatbelts. We are taking a trip to the mother city of Cape Town in South Africa. Trust me, you have to be there to fully understand what I'm about to tell you. My name is Timi Adibayo and I'll be your pilot for today. Now, we have landed. You are admiring the scenery. The Table Mountain is just right there. You're looking at the people. You love being here. It's a great time. But right now, there is traffic to your left and right. Refuse burning just around the corner. And industrial waste going up in the atmosphere right behind you. You and I are now being exposed to air pollution. Air pollution is particles and gases in the atmosphere. We call them PM2.5, PM10, NO2, SO2, and ozone. And according to WHO, globally, more than 4 million deaths are attributed to air pollution yearly. Currently in South Africa, an air quality index is being used to communicate the air quality levels to the public. 
And that's where my research comes into play. We are saying, let's evolve from that air quality index to an air quality health index. Okay, without being too technical, let me explain the difference to you. Picture this, five men walk into a bar, we're going to call them, you guessed right, PM 2.5, PM 10, NO2, SO2, and ozone. And they're not there to drink, they're there to vandalize and steal something. So the guys get to work, break a table, break a chair, and do whatever they want. And there's this particular pollutant, PM 2.5, he has the bright idea to steal the most prized possession in the bar, a very exquisite aged whiskey. He steals it and he goes away. The police comes around and said, oof, you stole the most prized possession in the bar. You, you and only you will be held responsible for all of the damage. That is the air quality index, a single pollutant approach. Making sure the worst offending pollutant is being held accountable for the crime. But that's what we're saying no. All five of them committed the crime to different degrees and they should all be equally on some level or according to the weight of their crime be held responsible for what they have done. That is the air quality health index. Each pollutant has adverse health effect on human health. And this has been proven so many times. You can find the research. It's there, tons of them. And by doing the air quality health index, we can adequately capture the air quality levels and give that back to the, to the public, making sure the control is in their hands and ensuring that they are properly educated about their exposure to air pollution. This is particularly important for frail population, those who are sick and more susceptible to the effects of air pollution. And by doing that, we put air pollution in numbers. Think about it this way, your weather forecast, but this time it's air quality levels. It's a three today, it's a good day, go out, and enjoy the weather. It's a seven, mm, that's quite high. So for general public, go out, but not too much. But for the frail population, all right, you want to go out, but try not to stay out for too long and do not do any strenuous activity. That is how we put the control back in, human, in, in, in people so that they can be more aware of their exposure to air pollution. Thank you. Once upon a time, there were two green comet fish. One fish asked the other fish if he wants to swim together to increase their explorative behavior. To answer the question correctly, the other fish needs to think about some things. One thing he needs to think about is what exactly is social facilitation? Social facilitation is the increase or decrease in the performance if the individual is in the presence of a conspecific, like if the fish taking a race. While they swim together, they're getting faster and faster and faster. They're even getting faster as when they swim alone. The other thing he needs to think about is what exactly is explorative behavior. Explorative behavior is an animal personality and is a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, the fish wants to new new things. On the other end of the spectrum, the fish avoids new things. To test if the fish increased the explorative behavior in the presence of a conspecific, we put the fish in a test tank with a new environment and measured the new area they visit. We tested the fish twice, once alone and once with a conspecific. Unexpected to us, there was no difference between single or cruise group treatment. Going back to the green comet, the green comet will answer, no, he doesn't want to swim together. But the other green comet has still an ace up his sleeve. Then on the real level, the fishes balance each other out. Some increase, some decrease the explorative behavior. Surprisingly, they still interact with each other. More specific, they synchronize the swimming behavior. So the green comet should answer that social facilitation can increase or decrease explorative tendency. How responsive a fish is towards social facilitation seems to depend on the behavior type of the focal fish. But there's still a lot to discover about which factor could play a role in the shaping effect of social facilitation in ex explorative behavior. Hello everyone, my name is Lita Palomares and I'm doing my PhD in public health and epidemiology. And today I would like to share with you an important issue that we need to change. Let me start without this. Many children today 
are growing up in an obesogenic environment that encourage them to weight gain and obesity. This is not just a phrase, this is a reality. Children with obesity are more likely to suffer obesity during their adulthood. And in many cases, children who have obesity also have parents with obesity or overweight. As you can see, childhood obesity is a serious global public health challenges and affecting every country in the world. And remember this data. In just 40 years, the number of school-age children and adolescents with obesity has risen more than tenfold, from 11 million to 124 million. So, what is happening? And maybe the main question would be what we need to change to end childhood obesity. Think about this. Obesity is a complex, multifactorial, and preventable disease. My PhD research project is focused in policies to prevent childhood obesity. And we need to act on these two important areas in order to fight childhood obesity. First one, food environment. Food environment has an important role in food choice, eating habits, and energy intake. Children need to be supported by food environments where, health, where a healthy choice is an easy and affordable choice. And they need to be protected from exposure to powerful marketing of foods and beverages. Also, governments need to implement policies to support healthy food environments. Second one, physical activity. Physical activity plays an important role preventing childhood obesity and reducing the risk of obesity in adulthood. Children need to do at least 60 minutes of physical activity every day. Government should increase policies priority to ensure safe and accessible environment for physical activity for children and adolescents. Finally, I strongly believe if we work all together, policymakers, stakeholders, professional health, researchers, and the population in general, we can end childhood obesity. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed these performances as much as I did. Now comes the most difficult part, and for this, I will hand it over to the jury. They will decide which three participants will continue to the next level to present Basel in FameLab Switzerland final. As I explained earlier, the jury will evaluate the performances of participants based on three Cs, content, clarity, and charisma. Before we continue with jury's decision, I would like to introduce them to you. Our jury consists of four people. The first one is Kristin Blume, who is a sleep scientist working at the Center of Chronobiology of the University of Basel in Psychiatric Hospital in Switzerland. Currently, her research focus is on the effects of natural daylight and artificial light on sleep. Besides doing research, she also enjoys doing science communication in German and English. Our second jury member is Satoshi Jean-Paul Sugimato, who is the Director of External Communications Switzerland at Novartis. He is an experienced communications professional with a strong track record of building and protecting the reputation of global companies, where he had a long experience working in multinational setting. Our third member is Frank Neumann, who is the head of the research office at the University of Basel. Previously, he was the coordinator at the Department of Biomedicine, University of Basel, and he worked as a research associate and postdoc at Rockefeller University. He had his PhD degree in biology. Last but not least, our fourth jury member is Sandra Ziegler, who is the managing director at EMH Schweizerische Arztverlag RG. And before that, she worked as the head of communications at Friedrich Michel Institute for Biomedical Research. She had her PhD degree in cell biology. Now that we met with our jury, we can switch to their meeting and learn the FameLab Basel finalists from them. 
Thank you very, very much for these 11 exciting and interesting talks. It's absolutely great to see so many young science communicators here. Um, it was not an easy decision, but we had to come to one. So the three people pa uh, participating in the national finals are... Natasha Hedrich, who showed us how to see single atoms. Eileen Berger, who introduced to us medicine for dead people. And Temi Tope Adebayo, who took us on a bar trip in Cape Town and uh, taught us how to quantify air pollution. <laughs>